Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's a huge honor to be here. Uh, what I want to tell you about is one of my passions, which is chemistry. And the kind of chemist that I am is the kind of person who loves to make things. It's a lot like cooking. And so the kinds of problems that I like working on are problems where everybody agrees what the potential solution should be, but nobody knows how to make the materials that you would need. And so in particular, what I want to tell you about are batteries, but I want you to get two main messages out of my story today. One, our goal, and I say our, it's me and my students, our goal is to build an amazing battery. We want to build a battery that is really powerful, lasts longer, is a lot safer, and ideally is cheaper to make so that everybody can use it. But along the way, we decided that if this battery is going to actually be useful, then that means hopefully a lot of people are going to use it someday. And so I was looking in my lab at all of the chemicals that I have, and I was imagining that multiplied by millions. And the real concern was the impact on the environment. And so I think in industry today, there's, a, there's an idea that either you can make a really great device or you can be environmentally friendly. And what I hope you get out of today is that you can do both. So first, let me tell you a little bit about what batteries are. Batteries are basically an energy storage device. They let you store energy so that you can use them later. And it, it's widely believed that the first battery is the one I'm showing you here on the left. This was developed by a physics professor in Italy, Alexander Volta, and it actually came out of an argument he had with a very good friend of his whose last name was Galvani. So for some reason I don't understand, they were hooking up two metals to frog legs, and what they figured out is if they could hook them up, they could make the legs move. And I should point out the legs were not attached to the frog anymore. So this was uh, quite a mystery. So lots of very public arguments, lots of pretty heated disagreements, and what Volta did to try to understand what this phenomenon was, was to replace the frog legs with two different metals. And here I'm showing you um, the Volta pile, which are plates of copper and zinc. They're separated by cardboard that's soaked in brine, basically salt solution. And his idea was that maybe the blood and the liquid and the frog legs acted basically as a salt solution. And he was right. So the one on the left is, is widely believed to be the first battery. I should say that what came out of this research is a different kind of battery. And out of respect for his friend, he named, it F, he named it the galvanic battery. And so what you should get out of that is scientists are used to disagreeing. This is how we learn, and this is how we exchange information. So this battery was developed in about 1800, but I should point out that recently, jars have been discovered outside Baghdad that date to 200 BC. And these jars are an iron rod encased in copper, and from the residue inside, they know they filled them with either wine or vinegar. And that now is believed to be the first battery, and they think they used it for electroplating. So we haven't come all that far in about 2,000 years, but this is what we use batteries for now. And so all of you, I'm sure, have laptops or cell phones, and the things that probably annoy you about these devices are that they don't last as long as you would like, they don't charge fast enough, more importantly, they're pretty expensive. And what the cell phone makers and the laptop battery makers would tell you is that the battery takes up way too much space in the device. And that takes away from space that you could use to add more functionality. Now the image on the top right is a Tesla Roadster. That's what I wish I had, although on my <laughs> assistant professor's salary, I can guarantee you I'll never own that car. But that is a true all-electric vehicle, and it is faster than a Lamborghini over short distances. Now the problem with these batteries, again, they don't last as long as you would like, they don't charge as fast. Another key problem is that they are very expensive. So the application on the bottom, I'm showing you a wind farm. You could easily replace that with solar panels. And the idea here is that a lot of the renewable energy we would like to use is intermittent. So the sun doesn't shine 24 hours a day and the wind doesn't always blow. So what we'd like to do is store that energy in batteries, but right now they're so expensive that it's really not reasonable. So this is why you should care about batteries. Now a key piece I'm not telling you about are some of the toxic chemicals that are typically found in a battery. And if you've been reading the news, surely you know about the Chevy Volt and some unfortunate fires, or maybe from a few years ago, you remember Sanyo recall for laptop fires. And this is really a problem with batteries. If they store a lot of energy, sometimes that energy comes out in ways that we don't like. And so we need to learn how to control that. So there's a lot of rich battery chemistry. And the reason I'm showing you this plot is because this is how battery people typically choose the kind of chemistry they want for the application they care about. So what I'm plotting on the y-axis is the energy density in terms of volume, and on the x-axis is energy density in terms of mass. And what you can see is that lead acid batteries, which we typically use for cars, are in the bottom left because they're really heavy. But the key thing about them is that they're really cheap. And then on the far top right, we have lithium metal batteries. And the reason those are so exciting is because they store a lot of energy, but lithium itself is pretty light. And that's why we use it for our portable applications. 
All batteries are basically built the same way to date. We're going to call this a two-dimensional battery. And what I want you to get out of these figures is that these are thin films that either get stacked or rolled. And the problem is that these films are pretty thick. They're also pretty expensive to make. They typically are made as separate pieces and then assembled. And so that's part of why this battery is too slow. Lithium ions take a long time to go from one thick slab to another. So when I came to CSU as a new assistant professor, I had never worked in batteries. But I knew how to make things, and I knew how to put them in devices to measure electrical properties. And so batteries seemed like a logical combination of my two passions. On the top, I'm showing you, just for comparison, what a conventional battery is. Um, I personally have an iPhone that I wish would last longer, so that's why we picked an iPhone. But I'm showing you on the top, it, it takes about two hours to do a full recharge. It lasts about seven hours if you use it pretty heavily. Again, multiple pieces with some toxic chemicals, and it really is a two-dimensional battery. What we decided we wanted to build was a battery that would charge a lot faster. And so you can imagine a phone now that you can charge in five minutes, but that will also last 10 hours. And that's a function of how we put all of the pieces together. Because we wanted to make this battery from scratch, we really had to think of a whole new architecture. And so what we decided to do is make a single piece that really is a three-dimensional architecture where the two electrodes of the, of the battery are close in contact. And that way, the lithium ions don't have very far to go. So this is a lot like if you lived very close to where you work, it doesn't take you very, very long to commute. And this is exactly what we're trying to do with this battery. But now here, this is a critical junction, and this is where I think it's important to understand how my students and I approach this problem. We decided that there actually was an off chance this could be useful someday. And for a lot of chemistry professors, that, that you know, you hope your research is useful, but it's not always. And so, whether you call it efficiency or laziness, I decided if you have to start from scratch and do something hard, it's better to just do it once than have to do it multiple times. So we decided, again, we want this to be environmentally friendly. So what we decided to do was make a list of all of the equipment we were not allowed to use. Nothing that was expensive or would give toxic byproducts. The same with the chemistry. We wanted this to all be made out of water on a bench top using non-toxic cheap chemicals. And so we decided to use a technique that's called electroplating to build our battery. This is very well-known technology. It's used widely in the semiconductor industry. It's used for plating jewelry, high-end car bumpers. And so although people know how to use electroplating and they know how to scale it up, it's never been used for batteries. So this is how we build our batteries. So if you look at the top image on the far left, we start with a piece of copper foam. Copper is typically used as one of the contacts in your cell phone and your laptop, but in this case, we use a lot less copper than you typically use because this structure is about 98% air. We use that as the electrode to do a plating where we plate now one of our electrodes and it is actually purple in real life, so I'm showing you that is purple. That process is done out of water using citric acid, which is a very common food preservative, and it's done at room temperature and it takes about 60 seconds. Now that's a good story in and of itself. My very first PhD student, I told them this is what we wanted to do, and I made the list. Okay, water, room temperature, bench top, you can't use anything toxic, and neither he nor I knew enough to know that that should not have been possible. So he's the one who came up with the citric acid idea, which is an amazing idea, and it actually worked. Then the next step, we decided, okay, we have to make this, this separator layer. Remember I told you Alexander Volta used cardboard as his separator. We need to use something a lot thinner. So we use polymer electrolytes that we've developed. And what electrolyte means is that these materials let lithium ions go back and forth, but they don't let electrons go back and forth. And that's important because that means the battery's not going to short. So another graduate student, I told them, all right, we need to do this electroplating. Uh, it turns out not many polymers are made by electroplating. And I told them, please try to figure out how to do it out of water. Again, non-toxic chemicals. That took a little bit longer. That's a very hard problem. But he solved it. And one of the main chemicals we use is commonly used as a laxative for infants. So again, not toxic. And then the last piece, we make an ink. It looks like black ink of our other electrode. We've modified it so it is also water-based. We add it on top, and it's just like adding water to a sponge. The rest of the structure soaks it in. We dry it, and we get a 3D battery. Now, what I should tell you is a lot of the structures that we make are really small, so you can't see them using a good optical microscope. You can't see them with light. So we use electron microscopes, and what I'm showing you on the bottom is an image of our foam coated with our anode. We haven't had the rest of the pieces in yet, but I just want to show you a picture. And in, in my field, we always show dimensions. So on the bottom right, I'm showing you what a millimeter distance is. 
Um, part of why I love this research is because a lot of it is just pictures, and the pictures are really pretty to look at. So if you zoom in, you can see a lot of features to the structure. This tells us a lot about how the material grew. It helps us make the next step even better. And you can see on the bigger image on the bottom left that there are some ridges, some parts are thicker, some parts are thinner. Part of how we designed this process is so that it is basically, it fixes itself as it goes. So at every step, the, the method for making the material is also the method that we use to test it. And then on the top right image, you can see these little cubes. And that's, that's characteristic of the material that we use. This is what the battery looks like if we freeze it and crack it. And I'm showing you that it really is not thin films. Now we have made a three-dimensional structure. The triangle you see in the middle is the copper foam. There's a thicker layer on each of the points, which you can see here and here. That's our anode material. The polymer coats it all the way around. And you see that our cathode wets really well to it, but it doesn't dissolve it. So what I can tell you today is that we've made a battery from scratch, not by thinking about the specific chemicals, but by first thinking about what our home run would be. And I think that is really key for how you want to approach not just science, but, uh, but other challenges in life. If you start with what your ultimate goals will be to begin with, it's a lot easier to get there, as opposed to just thinking one step at a time. Now, the key piece to all of this are my students, and I can't tell you enough about this. We did not approach this problem using highly esteemed scientists at huge companies. We started with undergraduates and graduate students. The first two people that helped me build my lab had just finished their freshman year at CSU, and so we were learning together. This is a more recent picture of my research group, and what you're seeing are all of my PhD students, ranging from first year all the way to fifth year students, and all of the people on the left either were in my group or are currently in my group. And the key here is that I think it's really important for a, kind, a problem like this that has so many layers to it to assemble people with very different backgrounds and very different ways of viewing the world. And this comes back to the story I told you at the beginning about Volta and his friend Galvani. Disagreeing is one of the best ways to learn from each other as long as you keep an open mind, you show respect, and you're willing to learn from people who are younger than you or maybe don't know anything about a field that you're trying to work on. And that is the only reason we made it this far on this battery. None of us knew enough to know that it should have been very difficult. So we set our goals high, worked step by step, and in that way, hopefully soon, you'll have a battery in your cell phone or laptop that'll be really fast. Ideally, we'll have hybrid electric vehicles in a few years that will let you charge quickly. We'll help you use regenerative braking in your vehicle a lot more efficiently so you'll drive further. And then hopefully, later on in my career, I will solve the other side of the problem, which is these batteries still have to be plugged into a wall, and where they draw that power from maybe is not so clean. So part of the students you see on this picture are also working on solar cells. And we're trying to kind of close the loop that way. Um, another key piece of this battery we've designed is we tried to make it last a long time because we still don't know how to recycle it efficiently. But we're working on that, and I think that's also another important piece of this problem. If you're going to mass produce any device, I think it's really important to think about the end of its life cycle and what people are going to do with it at the end so that we don't impact the environment on the back end of that. So with that, hopefully you got two messages. Battery technology is alive and well and pretty exciting now. There is a way to make a world-class battery that is also green and environmentally friendly. And the key to all of this is this could not have been done with one person. It was a collection of people from different ages, different backgrounds, all working together in the same way. Thank you very much for your time.